Hi, hello everyone. Um, can we start by asking everyone to make sure that you're on mute? Uh, I think everyone pretty much is. Okay. Um, excellent. So, uh, so we have more people coming in or we're fine? Uh, no. Uh, let's just give it one more minute. There's still quite a few people joining us. So, and then we'll kick it off right away. Okay. Shall we? Yeah, we're recording. Yeah, very good. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. So, this is the first session, the first public lecture of the series on the state of the art uh, in basic income policy research. Actually, the research got slightly cut off from uh, the announcements. Uh, so the purpose of this lecture series, which of course is a lecture series sponsored by the Gutz Werner Chair. Uh, I'm a visiting professor there at the moment. My name is Jürgen Wispelaar and, and also Freebis. Uh, so it's a joint event. Um, this is a lecture series that is partly public lecture series, but also partly a master's course. So every time we have a public lecturer, the next um, day, uh, you know, myself and a group of master's students will be discussing the paper and its implications for this kingdom debates. And the focus of the lecture series is very much on this kingdom policy. So we've selected six people who, in my view, have really written a very interesting material that is at the forefront of basic income debate, or should be at the forefront of basic income debate. And so the idea is that these lecturers will be presenting the article in some detail, but also, you know, take the opportunity to reflect a bit more of where this is coming from, and especially what is the link to the broader income debate uh, and, you know, so um, the way we're going to run this, uh, so I will do a brief introduction. Um, I will introduce Milena just for, you know, for a minute. And then um, she will talk for about half an hour. Afterwards, uh, there will be time for questions. Okay, I'm just going to reserve the last five minutes myself, last three to five minutes myself to have a little conversation with Milena, so to speak. I have a couple of questions prepared myself, but there will be plenty of time for us to discuss things. Um, so very, very briefly, uh, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Mlena Buchs, I hope I pronounced that correct, uh, who is originally from Germany, but is currently a professor of sustainable welfare at the University of Leeds, and previously was working uh, at the University of Southampton, so I'm very well versed in the UK academia. Um, so Professor Books is, uh, is an expert basically in environmental social science, right? With a very, very strong focus on uh, issues around sustainable welfare, which is also the topic of her lecture. She is the co-PI or PI of three projects, main projects at the moment, including a Horizon Europe project towards the sustainable welfare economy, sorry, well-being economy. Um, but also, for example, a project on uh, carbon emissions, right? And a separate project on the provision of green services. So one of her key features, uh, the, well, the, the focus of this, this lecture today, but also in general, her interest seems to be very much about, uh, you know, what, what are green services and how does that fit with green income provision, so to speak. So very much a universal basic income and universal basic services. So without further ado, I, I give the floor to Milena. Milena, you have 30 minutes. Thank you so much, Jürgen, for the, uh, for the introduction, for organizing this whole lecture series, which is really quite exciting. And hello to everyone. Thank you very much for joining. So I'm, I have some slides, which I will share. Give me a second. I hope you can see, see my slides. Can get someone give me a thumbs up? Yeah, great. Um, so yes, so I'm going to talk about um, universal basic income and universal basic services in a comparison, sort of from a sustainable welfare perspective. Um, I will define sustainable welfare as I go along and um, 
yeah, discuss whether or not there are conflicts between these two approaches. So the background to the paper, which is the, the background for this uh, lecture, is really the argument that we need to move to a post-growth economy. So basically a co an economy that does not prioritize GDP growth, but prioritizes people's well-being and ecological objectives. Um, and that is mainly due to the climate and ecological emergency. So there's currently no empirical evidence that it's possible to decouple emissions and material use in absolute terms from GDP growth uh, globally um, and not at the speed required to actually meet climate targets and ecological targets. So this is one of the main arguments for moving to a post-growth economy. But moving to a post-growth economy throws up a lot of questions around how are we going to organize the economy and especially how we are going to organize uh, welfare and the welfare state. How are we going to ensure that we can actually support people on lower incomes and provide the welfare services that we have, uh, have at the moment? So sustainable welfare as a, as a subject or discipline almost um, is concerned exactly with these sorts of questions um, about how can we design and finance uh, social policy in a post-growth context. And so in this context, then universal basic income, UBI, and universal basic services, UBS, um, have both been promoted as approaches that can support sustainable welfare, um, often sort of separately. And they're often presented as conflicting approaches. And that is really what this paper is, is concerned with. So critics on the left, the critics of UBI on the left often argue that UBI would take resources away from funding essential services. And they also criticize that UBI could be abolished much more easily than universal basic services basically because UBI would be sort of less institutionalized compared to services where you have whole administrations behind the provision of a service. And another um, uh, conflict or, or problem that's sometimes pointed out by UBI supporters is, um, uh, sorry, by UBS supporters is that UBI does not sufficiently challenge the logic of capitalism itself. Um, in contrast to UBS, it does not actually address how production is organized. Um, yes, it would decommodify labor because it provides an income that is independent from employment, but it doesn't really address the sort of the capital labor relationship um, and, and how the, the economy is organized more fundamentally. So the question for this paper then is, how do UBI and UBS compare from a sustainable welfare perspective? And are they really in conflict with each other or not? Um, and I can maybe say a few words about how the idea for this paper came about. So because that also gives you a little bit of an insight into where I stand on this debate. And I've been for a very long time, uh, been very sympathetic towards UBI. Um, my PhD supervisor, for example, and Klaus Offer is, is one of the promoters of, of UBI. And I've always seen it as you know, I've sort of been growing up, so to speak, academically with this idea that UBI is this cool idea which um, offers um, social security um, from a green perspective and also a post-growth perspective. Until one day, um, Anna Kut was invited to give a talk um, at Leeds in our research group uh, seminar about universal basic services. So that was the first time, that is about maybe four, five years ago, I can't ex exactly remember, maybe four years ago. And um, I, that was the first time I engaged with UBS in, a, in more detail and it threw up lots of questions for me because I found some of her arguments very interesting and convincing and it got me thinking about UBI. UBI. And so this is, you know, basically I wrote the paper to clarify all, the, all of these questions for myself and I really hope that um, the paper also helps others to think about the differences and overlaps, I think, in some, in some cases uh, between UBI and UBS. So here goes. Um, so first of all, what are UBI and UBS? 
Um, I don't hopefully need to explain to this audience what UBI is, so I will keep this really short. I uh, define UBI in this paper as an equal, unconditional income paid to every resident by the state. Um, universal basic services is a more recent concept which has been put forward by the Institute for Global Prosperity in 2017. It is a concept that is now supported by organizations like the New Economics Foundation, NEF, um, including in their proposal for what they call a social guarantee, which is a combination of UBS and a guaranteed income, which is not a universal basic income, but a sort of guaranteed minimum income. So universal basic services can be defined as collectively provided basic services. So I say collectively here because it can be public or collective. So it's it is left open to some extent in the debate whether it needs to be the state necessarily who provides these services or whether it could be other organizations that collectively provide um, basic services. Uh, the services will be provided free for everyone at the point of use and it would be based on needs. So there would in some cases be a needs assessment, I suppose, for example, for healthcare. Um, we know universal basic services actually when it comes to healthcare and education many countries already have these sorts of services in place um, but the debate uh, seeks to expand the idea to new areas as well things like energy in the home uh, transport water internet so basically other services that are that we need for survival and the idea is, is to, to expand universe, universal basic services into these areas. And for some of them, you could actually think about an equal per capita provision. Um, so, for example, provide every household with a basic um, amount of electricity, let's say, or a, a bus pass or something like that. And we have seen some governments you know, taking up these sorts of measures in the recent energy crisis. So universal basic services then focuses on production and provision rather than just consumption, you could say, maybe with UBI, where people get cash and then they can decide what to what to buy with the cash. Um, also, before I go into com comparing UBI and UBS, I should briefly define what sustainable welfare is, because I will be comparing them from a sustainable welfare perspective and be taking criteria that I associate with sustainable welfare. So I define sustainable welfare in the paper as social policies that support the satisfaction of human needs within planetary boundaries and without economic growth. Um, and then I define four criteria of sustainable welfare. So I think all these four things are important to achieve sustainable welfare, which are planetary boundaries, need satisfaction, fair distribution, and democratic governance. So I will go through each of these to compare sustainable welfare. I will actually not start with the environmental criterion because I think um, there are some points in the fair distribution and need satisfaction criteria that are good to understand before we come to the uh, to the environmental um, issues. So starting then with fair distribution, because I think this is in some sense the, the easiest to talk about, um, the, the two proposals are actually quite similar. So UBI is thought to be distributionally progressive, which means it benefits low-income households compared to high-income households in, in relative terms. Um, because if you give every household the same amount of income, then that is worth more to low-income households in relative terms compared to high-income households. The situation gets complicated, is a little bit more complicated because you need to take into account whether previous benefits would be abolished with an introduction of UBI. So one needs to take that into account to calculate the net effect um, of the distribution. And in addition, you also need to consider how UBI is financed. So if UBI is financed, let's say through a progressive income tax or a progressive wealth tax, which uh, taxes richer households more than poorer households, then richer households could actually end up with a net loss compared to a net gain for poorer households. So that would be even more progressive in distributional terms. 
but there are lots of ifs here. So you can see, you know, the exact distributional impacts of the UBI um, taking both financing and the changes in previous benefits into account, you know, is can can be quite complex. And in some sense, one actually cannot categorically sort of um, answer the question how um, progressive a UBI actually is, because it depends on these other factors. Um, for UBS, the situation is actually quite similar, because even though it is more complicated to calculate the value of UBS, um, uh, you know, you need to do that first. So basically, UBS can be seen as an in-kind income. So people receive a service, let's say they go to the doctor and receive a service, um, health assessment and, and treatment and so on, that has a value associated. Um, and um, that applies to any other service provided. So basically, this is why the services provided can be counted as an in-kind income. So then the question becomes, who consumes these services, which ones and how much? And there's not actually that much literature on it, but um, I found a report, um, which is now a little bit dated, I have to admit, uh, which came from the OECD, which basically tried to calculate what the value is of services that people receive. And they concluded that even though richer and poorer households uh, consume slightly different public services, um, in, on aggregate and on average, the value received from these services is relatively evenly distributed across income groups. And so this would mean we have a similar situation here compared to UBI, that basically the distributional impacts then depend on whether any other benefits are changed or and or how universal basic services are financed. Um, but basically both have lots of potential for having progressive distributional impacts and are therefore good from a, from a fair distribution perspective and hence a tick there from a sustainable welfare perspective. So then moving on to need satisfaction, um, the idea is, um, you know, that, um, I mean, I could go into sort of defining basic universal basic needs and things like that. I don't actually have time to do that, unfortunately. Um, my thinking around needs has been very much shaped by the literature, um, uh, you know, by Ian Goff, um, um, Manfred Max Neef and so on, writing about human needs. Um, and, and this term has become very popular within the post-growth literature and the sustainable welfare literature because um, we are talking here about sufficiency. So it's about basically finding a measure that can tell us how much consumption is enough. And need satisfaction seems to be a sort of perspective that uh, enables us to talk about what is enough, you know, and hence sort of define in a way maybe a limit for, for consumption. Um, so need satisfaction then is, is really important. We need to think about how, how can we design economies so that everyone in the economy has their basic needs satisfied. Um, UBI contributes to need satisfaction indirectly because it provides a more secure income. So people can then use that income to purchase the goods and services that they need. UBS does this in a bit it does this more directly because it provides certain basic services directly so this is you know one of the uh, di key differences i think between ubi and ubs um the indirect versus direct sort of addressing of need satisfaction and both ubi and ubs would give people more time so this the theory at least uh, for people to engage in purposeful activities that can then be beneficial for their own well-being and the well-being of others. So typical examples are engaging in care work and volunteering, participation in democracy and things like that, um, which actually directly, again, sort of serve need satisfaction. Um, and um, the one, one complication, however, is that the provision of UBI and UBS might lead producers to increase prices or reduce wages because now they know that people have that additional income. And so 
that could compromise need satisfaction to some extent because if people's incomes actually stay stable or even go down depending on where prices and wages go then we do, haven't haven't much won in terms of need satisfaction so that is maybe something to to factor in here so moving on to the environmental impacts um, of UBI and UBS and this is really quite quite complicated I try to summarize it as best as I can um, so you know basically if you want the the summary of the answer sort of um, up first I would say it is not actually possible to give a very clear answer on this question um, partly because we simply don't know how UBI and UBS would play out in reality um, not just in a trial but sort of in the context where they're actually functioning as they're supposed to function so to start with the idea is is that both UBI and UBS could be beneficial from a sustainable but from an ecological point of view um, because they would lead to reduced supply of labor so that is because people now have a secure secure income so they don't need to um, be employed uh, to earn more money they could hence reduce you know the supply of labor and that would lead to less consumption and hence to reduced material throughput and hence lower growth or maybe even negative growth um, however, the situation here is complicated by the fact that different income groups might respond differently um, to the provision of a universal basic income and universal basic services. Um, I should, should have said that I count here universal basic services as an in-kind income, so I treat them as quite similar in that respect. Um, and like I said, um, we don't know exactly how prices and wages would react in such a scenario um, so one theoretical argument in the literature is that low-income groups might actually increase labor supply um, under a UBI scheme for example because eligibility criteria disappear so this is sometimes actually used as you probably all know as a pro-argument for UBI to say you know we uh, could actually uh, increase labor market inclusion of, of low-income groups um, however, yeah, like I said, this would not necessarily be the case if, if um, prices, let's say, increase. So richer households also might decrease labor supply because they might value leisure over additional money. But if we think back about the back to the distributional debate, the question would be whether rich households have a net loss or a net gain from um, universal basic income and universal basic services if they have a net loss they might actually also uh, at least keep their labor supply stable or maybe even increase it to make up for the loss because you know they might not want a decrease in their living standards so yeah so all these sort of open questions that we don't quite know um, how they would play out in reality um, UBI trials also, to my knowledge, I'm, you know, I'm not like, I haven't, I have to admit, I haven't scanned the whole literature uh, on this, but the ones that I know of um, where UBI trials measure the impact on uh, the supply of employment, uh, on uh, supply of labor, remain inconclusive in the sense that some trials say labor supply has increased, some find that labor supply decreased um, even among similar groups like lower income groups so it really a lot depends on how the trial is designed whether it only focuses lower income groups or whether it works on a sort of whole whole population basis what other criteria uh, are applied etc cetera, etc cetera. so the summary would be we do not exactly know how labor supply would um, play out uh, in such a scenario so there are some more additional arguments for possible environmental impacts of UBI and UBS so for example if UBI increases income of low-income households one argument is that the environmental impacts could actually be negative in the sense that um, spending by lower income households tends to be more carbon intensive per monetary unit 
Um, and this is because they spend a higher proportion of their income on carbon intensive goods and services like home energy, for example, or motor fuels. Um, the other argument, and so, you know, from a neoliberal perspective, I guess UBI is sometimes promoted with the argument that it could increase efficiency in the economy because we might be able to abolish some other benefits and might need less administration and so on. And sometimes that is actually used as an argument that UBI could even uh, support economic growth. And obviously, <laughs> that would not be good for from a uh, from an environmental perspective, because that would have environmental uh, impacts. Um, however, both, I think, um, have um, the possibility or um, uh, to, to reduce environmental impacts because they, if they are successful in making society more equal, that could lead to less conspicuous consumption, um, a term coined by Veblen, I think, um, which is consumption that people do to improve their social status and that comes from a quite a sort of competitive um, character in society. So that could could improve and and hence that part of consumption at least could reduce. Um, and UBS is sometimes promoted by uh, by environmentalists by saying that the provision of services could be made more environmentally friendly straight away. So basically, because universal basic services are provided um, either by the state or by collective uh, organizations, uh, the services could be designed in a greener way straight away, including in healthcare, um, energy efficient social housing, low carbon public transport um, are some examples here. Um, uh, I'm having a quick look at my watch to see whether I should talk about this slide. So I will only touch on this, but basically in a different paper, we did a quick sort of micro simulation to see what happens if you give, if you raise a carbon tax and then either give people back the revenue in cash terms on an equal per capita basis, or if you give people vouchers for green services. So for example, renewable energy, renewable electricity, or um, public transport. And on the graphs here, you can see the uh, the changes in emissions. So basically the reduction in emissions that you can achieve with these different approaches. And we found that having a tax rebate reduced emissions by fairly little, both for motor fuels and home energy. Whereas if you give people vouchers um, that have these green designs uh, you know that 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 are inherently green because they provide people with renewable electricity rather than normal grid electricity, and where people move from car travel to public transport, then you automatically have these um, carbon savings. This is obviously hypothetical, right? So it's it's really just a sort of thinking exercise to see what happens if. But from that perspective, I think the argument that if you provide green services directly rather than giving people money that they spend in the existing economy, um, you know, that you have better environmental outcomes um, uh, of, of green service provision is fairly convincing. A quick word about democratic governance. So this is important because um, obviously, if we talk about universal basic services provision, one counter argument is often that that could be top down um, that there wouldn't be much sort of scope for citizens to actually participate in the design of the services and that hence the services might not actually be responsive to people's needs. So, so that is where the criterion for democratic governance comes from. Um, and then looking at both, I think both have quite good potential to improve a democratic governance. So for example, both UBI and UBS could give, give people more time to engage in political processes and organizational democracy. Again, with the uh, you know uh, sort of basic argument that uh, people would have more time on their hands because they don't need to to work um, to earn that money. Um, they could also spend more time for education, which is beneficial for participating in political processes. Um, and because of greater social security. 
people might be more trusting in politicians and that in itself could improve the quality of democracy. So I think both approaches are fairly similar from that perspective. Um, but I come back to the, you know, to the importance of um, having um, good governance for UBS in particular uh, to ensure that it ticks these, these boxes for democratic governance. So on then to the, to the second question, is there a conflict between UBI and UBS? Um, UBS supporters criticize that UBI is reliant on market provisioning, as you've heard, I think, um, you know, in what I discussed so far. So uh, the argument here is, is that if there are market failures, then markets might not actually provide the goods and services that people need at the right quality and cost. So in other words, UBI might not be very useful um, if the goods and services that people need are not provided. Uh, a common example in the literature is, you know, if a single parent receives a UBI, um, would they, the question is, would they be able to provide um, for decent, would this be able to, would they be able to um, purchase decent housing with this UBI in an overheating, uh, sorry, in an overheated housing market or renting market? And this might not be the case, so UBI might not be sufficient in that sort of scenario. Um, and the other counter argument or the other criticism of UBI from a UBS perspective is that UBI does not directly uh, address production and would therefore not directly change the environmental impact of consumption. So in other words, yeah, producers would just go on producing environmentally harmful uh, goods and services. Um, we just give people money uh, to purchase these goods and services. So UBS supporters then highlight that UBS would cater directly for people's needs, as I've discussed previously, um, and that they claim UBS could be directly provided in an environmentally friendly way. Um, and then they have this uh, sort of third and probably main argument about the conflict uh, that UBI could crowd out universal basic services. So basically, there's a financial conflict here. Governments can't governments can't afford to uh, finance both the UBI and UBS. I, I, I do think actually that is probably quite a fair argument. Um, however, in the article, I try to play sort of devil's advocate and you know respond to these criticisms of UBI um, and say sort of where they have a point and where maybe UBS also makes promises that are based on certain assumptions that we cannot necessarily take for granted. So, for example, UBI, in my view, is not inherently reliant on market provisioning. Um, it, it seems to be the argument in the UBS literature that UBI is always thought to be sort of in a capitalist context where markets are, you know, relatively unregulated, um, or we are not really concerned with market regulation. And hence, there's no change in the environmental impact of our consumption uh, in the way we work um, and, and so on. But of course, markets can be regulated. We could think of having things like maximum rents in place or energy efficiency standards for accommodation and production. There could be emission caps um, at the country level and so on. So if you know some of these regulations were in place, you could say UBI could actually be a good thing because um, the consumption automatically automatically becomes more environmentally friendly as well. Um, also on the pro side, I think UBI does provide choice. So yes, we are thinking here of a scenario where goods and services are provided on the market. And for certain needs, choice is good, right? We, uh, for food and clothing, for example, we want people to have the opportunity to choose what they want to consume. Um, UBS is, in that, from that perspective, maybe more suitable for more uniform needs, where even though it is very, very important how the services are designed, so for example, electricity or, or water or things like that, it is obviously very important to know what is the proportion of renewable electricity in the grid and things like that. But once the service is provided, um, it doesn't, you know, all that matters to people is that they have 
uh, enough kilowatt hours that they con can consume in a day or week or month. Um, we are not concerned about whether, yeah, you know, there, there are no differences between red and green and blue <laughs> um, kilowatt hours, if that makes sense. So, um, so that that is sort of one side of the debate to sort of think about what are they actually each suitable for. Um, also, I think one needs to be a bit careful with these arguments to say that UB UBS would automatically provide more environmentally friendly services. I think all these things fundamentally uh, rely on political decision making. So um, if the government doesn't decide to provide services in a greener way, then the service provision would not necessarily be greener. Um, so hence, a really important condition for green UBS would be that uh, that collective provision needs to be guided by ecological and well-being priorities. Um, and as I've already hinted at, democratic governance of collective provisioning is also very important because otherwise you have that problem of top-down governance of, of need satisfaction. So who's deciding you know, what our needs are and how they should be fulfilled? I think essentially the, these sorts of questions need to be negotiated in democratic decision-making processes and citizens need to have the opportunity to collaborate um, and feed into uh, these processes and to also hold these um, service providers to account. So, and then finally on the finance question, I think um, what matters there is to see, you know, what is the revenue that we can collate <laughs> through taxes for example, and how do we allocate this revenue? So as long as we make sure that there's no competition between the UBI portion of providing people with um, a UBI, UBS combo, um, you know, that could be fine. So I think, so this is why in the paper, I talk about a partial UBI, which could cover the, the types of needs and, and services where choice is important. Um, and then we would have enough um, resources left to still also provide universal basic services for things where that is likely to be quite beneficial. So in conclusion then, while UBI and UBS are often presented as conflicting approaches, um, I argue in the paper that they can actually complement each other and can support sustainable welfare, i.e. promote a fairer and greener society. Um, I try to already highlight that I think the social and environmental outcomes of UBI and UBS cannot be determined just you know, in the abstract. Um, they are very much shaped by institutional contexts. Um, so for example, the governance of markets and of provisioning systems is absolutely key. And what are the sort of contextual environmental policies and standards, uh, the quality of democracy and participation. Um, that would absolutely determine um, how UBI and UBS each function um, in a specific context. And in addition, also um, sort of other economic policies which interact with UBI and UBS. So for example, in terms of working time, what other taxation do we have? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, so that is that is what I um, that that's the conclusion that I came to in the paper to, in a way, um, try to be conciliatory between these two and say, I think both of them have really good points and um, could work well together. And um, they have they come from quite different perspectives, but I think both of them can be, uh, designed such that they can support sustainable welfare. So I leave it here, um, and I'm probably I've probably already spent more time than I was allowed to. Sorry about that. <laughs> and I'm very much looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Time is also a basic need, of course. <laughs> so thanks very much, Melina. That that was really interesting. I like the conclusion. It's very much like have your cake and eat it. And uh, you know we all like cake very much, so that definitely works for me. 